Welcome, dear friends, to 30 Days with the Master, 30 Days of Good News with the Master. This is day 13. Yay! 13 days already. And for those who are entering just now, this is a therapeutic journey studying the book Good News by the authorship is Humberto de Campos through the medium Chico Xavier. Let's not forget that here we have a book that is in Portuguese originally, translated into English and soon to be published by its publisher, the Brazilian Spiritist Federation. Hello, Monica and Adilson. Good seeing you here. So, this chapter today is about sin and punishment. Ay, 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 ay. I'm not so sure. Hello, Albita. Hello, Rose. <clears throat> so, friends, let us let us meditate one thing. Why we're doing this at midnight? Because midnight symbolizes the transition from a day to the next and the beginning of a new day. And Jesus is the one that leads us into a new day inside of us, hopefully every day. Also, it's about recalling the first Christians, like recollecting their, their gatherings at the catacombs in the middle of the night so they wouldn't be persecuted. Just studying Paul and Stephen, we paid attention to that and we thought about, you know, following the mentor's um, suggestion that we practice a little bit of it also for ourselves. Hello, Solange and Raquel. Thank you, too. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As we said, today's chapter 13, day 13, the title, Sin and Punishment. Oh, wow. Man, what are we going to learn here? This chapter begins like this. Jesus had finished one of his preaching in the public square when he realized the crowd was in an uproar. So he just finished the preachings and a crowd who was like, Rrr, came along. Some more exalted people burst, burst out into screams while a breathless woman with disheveled hair and gaunt face approached him, pleading for protection from the corner of her sad eyes. The many Jews crowded there, aroused the general mood, demanding the stoning of a sinner in conformity with the ancient traditions. This chapter is really ay ay ay, but it's about us, all of us on the earth. Hello, sunshine. Hope it's warm in California. I know, albeit I miss you too. Oh, thank you, Rose. Yeah, you just watched the movie Spirit of Christmas, right? Yesterday, the recommendation that we watch that movie, The Spirit of Christmas. It's very, very interesting. And thank you for your love. Yes, we are very grateful too for this community together at midnight. It's empowering all of us. We're learning so much, so therapeutic, right? Because Jesus is the master. He didn't die. He still lives. And his lessons are immortal. By the way, the lessons are not only for us the, or for the disciples, are for the whole world. Snow tomorrow, sunshine? No way. Wow. California has become so surprising. Now, imagine. Jesus finished the preachings and the crowd came along and this breathless woman came and the Jews crowded around the general mood and asked for the stoning of the sinner. Jesus was then asked, to judge the customs of the people. The master exclaimed, okay, before we go there, how often 
Do people come to you asking that you become the judge of a case? That you give them the final word? That you define, you sentence people in the family, at work, friends, neighborhood, communities, organizations? How often does that happen to you? Often? So here we have our guiding model guiding us towards the approach. Okay? He is the guiding model. As the guiding model, he is now teaching us what to do in those circumstances. Okay? Often when people revisit this case of the woman, the adulterer, they only think about the woman, if she made it, and the, the, those who are accusing, but they forgot to look at Jesus. We forget often to look at him and observe his body language, observe how he approached the scenario, so we can learn it when that happens to us. The master exclaimed, the master exclaimed, with serenity. Now think about this. Umberto becomes so wise in his writing. He says, the master exclaimed with serenity. Because often we think exclaims like loud, impositional in a way, very strong, but with serenity. And fearlessness. He was serene and fearless. How often do people ask you to jump into a, a commotion, a discussion, a problem, and you're like breathless too, like, oh my gosh, do I have to say anything? And if I do, I'm like, you are bad, you did this, you have to pay, blah, 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 whatever we say. Jesus now, serene, firm, but fearless, right? It's an amazing story. Hello, says Thank you, Rose. It, it is an amazing story. Felipe, João Bosco. People were astonished when they heard him say, He who is without sin cast the first stone. An unsettling shock was felt by the whole assembly. An unsettling shock. Shock. Okay? People were shocked. Mm -hmm. Like nowadays. Somebody does something and we don't see, you know, measures being taken and we may be shocked too. The accusations were silenced. The crowd was introspective. And while the master began to write on the ground without any concern, you know, meditating on this writing on the ground without any concern, he was showing to us that by our choices at each and every moment, we are writing our history in the soil of the earth. He had clean, clear conscience. That's why he had no concern. But he couldn't tell for the others. So in a way, his emotional body language and his body language, no words telling. It's up to you what you're going to choose. Because I am minding my business. You, whatever you choose, going to define your next moment. Mm -hmm. When we judge, we are opening doors to being judged. How do we know? We have inside of us our conscience and if we don't if we judge people right we're going to keep that judgment within so if we ever incur the same mistake we are already sentencing ourselves we already know the sentence some people tell me if somebody does this to me i'll never forgive them how can people ever do this? Well, people can. Jesus is going to explain us why. So, in the writing on the ground without any concern, Jesus was telling us many messages. One, mind your business, because as you speak, you are writing it down in your 
history book, personal history book. You know, we all have our personal history book, right? And we are writing inside of us. As Leon Denis says in the book, after death, we are writing it and it's imprinted in our spiritual body. That's how it is. Hello, Valeria. Hello, Jussara. Yes, friends, we have uh, our personal history book. The world can write about us whatever they like. But here, we have our own history book. We know it. That's why Joana de Angelis told Divaldo Franco once, do not defend yourself. We don't have to. We don't need to. <laughs> Love the center and the happy face, Jussara. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you for the heart. But friends, think about this. We have a pers our personal history book. And Jesus was showing to us, we're all writing it down. Are you sure you want to judge? Right? Okay, let's keep going. This is our free translation of it. <laughs> Gradually, the place became almost deserted. People psh, disappeared. Oh, yeah. Only Jesus and some disciples remained there with the woman beside them, concealing her face with her hands. She was ashamed. And shame on us for creating that embarrassment for her. Because her life is her life, is not ours. At a given moment, the master raised his brow. You see, he's showing to us, like, that's why I'm practicing every day. <laughs> raise his brow and ask the unhappy woman. I don't know how he was but doing that, but that's exactly the body language. We need to visualize it. He raised his brow and asked the unhappy woman, Woman, where are your judges? Where are they? Where? Hello, Elaine. Good seeing you here. Where are your judges? Noting that the sinner answered him with a gaze of appreciation, while crying tears mixed with gratitude and joy, Jesus then continued, Has no one condemned you? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Okay. Keep the lesson. Let's keep going. With the disciples in Jesus, we're going to learn much more than we can imagine. The unfortunate woman went away. She was experiencing a new sensation in her spirit. The generosity of the Messiah illuminated her heart in vivid rays of light that bathed her entire life, her entire soul. Friends, the generosity of Jesus changed her. No wonder Andre Lewis in the book Spirit is Conduct talks about virtue as being something that is beyond words. Virtue is not a mouth that speaks. It's light that is radiated from us. Generosity. You probably have watched the movie Les Miserables. Forgive my accent here in French or attempting French, but Victor Hugo in that story talked about how the generosity of the priest changed the life of Jean Valjean. Right? Am I right? The name of the character? Probably. If not, you guys let me know there, okay? So, friends, it's very important for us to... This is... This time is about Christmas and reflections, etc. And we think, what am I going to do? What am I going to do externally? Just be generous. And you see, Jesus didn't give her bread or money or clothes or he didn't sing to her. What did he do? He was generous. 
generous how? With money? You see how this book is revolutionary. It presents to us the concept of generosity without money. Because we tend to think that generosity equals to money. No. Generosity of feelings, of kindness. We need more kindness. We need to be kinder. And in being kinder, being generous in our kindness, not just a little bit of kindness, abundant kindness. Like we learned yesterday, the chapter about love and renunciation, the coin of life, love, renunciation. It's impossible to love without letting go of our needs to facilitate the life of somebody else, to make it easier. So here we are learning with Jesus a new tool in life, generosity, generosity of feelings. Listen to loved ones, the generosity of listening to people. They want to speak to you? Just listen. They want to something from you. Like the people wanted Jesus to judge. He was generous. He was not being strict. Many spirits are too strict. And they forget that Jesus was never strict. He came to fulfill the law, but the law of love. And the law of love is not about judging people. It's about correcting, correcting the behavior, the mistakes, first inside of us. And I see many spiritists who are wasting time, day in, day out, meeting friends and asking that we build a list of books that are should be prohibited. That we should observe what people are doing, talking about this line of thought and that other thought. Jesus never did that. Never. He was always generous. Oh, people are making a mistake. Oh, well. Oh, well. Who doesn't? You? Are you sure you want to cast a stone? I'm writing on the ground. We all have our personal history books. Are you sure? Oh, but Vanessa, somebody has to do that job. Thank you. But Jesus never did that job. Okay? He never, ever in a million years put himself in the place of a judge. Why are you going to do it? Why do you think you should be in charge of a role that our guide and model never fulfilled? He's our guide and model. Let's not be like Judas, think that we know more than a master. Because if he didn't fulfill the role of a judge, so shouldn't we. We shouldn't. No judging. No condemning. Always loving and embracing. Mm -hmm. Right? Thank you for sharing, Osvaldo, that Jesus changed you too. I agree. Changes us every day. Hello, Daniel Castellani. Now, here we have, while the sinner left filled with intense joy, the few disciples who were with the Lord could not hide the awkwardness that his gesture had caused them. <laughs> Can you imagine their faces? <laughs> Can you imagine, right? Mm hmm you're right, Adilson. I think often I think we're closer to being a Pharisee than than truly Christian. Sometimes not judging anybody, but we're too used to that. But that's exactly what we're gonna learn today. He's gonna say something so beautiful. Hopefully, we're gonna live just like this woman, feeling joyful, feeling we're changed, feeling that we're more open, freer, freer of what our inner perspectives. Let's get rid of all of the things that don't you have any good use any longer. Why did Jesus not condemn that woman? Everybody was asking. So John approached John. Young John. Remember, John is so young, but he also had his things. It's not about age. John approached and uh, interrogated him. You see, he didn't ask. He interrogated Jesus and you know, Umberto de Campos 
reports this without sparing words. He's really meaning, like, interrogating. You see how sometimes in our youthfulness of spirit, we dare to interrogate the Master. How can we? How do we dare doing that? But John did it for us. Master, why did you not condemn the harlot who has led such an infamous life? So judgmental, loving John. Hello, Nina. Jesus directed at the disciple a calm and kind look. You see, with Jesus, we're taking a course on how to, you know, do this beautiful samba of life. People interrogate us, and we're like calm and kind. We need to learn with him. Interrogation, calm and kind. And then he said, What reasons do you claim to hold such a conviction, John? Do you know why that poor woman played the harlot? Have you ever suffered the harshness of the vicissitudes that she went through in her life? You ignore her major needs and the temptations that made her succumb halfway. You do not know how many times she had been the object of scorn by her parents, her children, and the siblings of joyous young women. It, went not, it wouldn't be fair to aggravate the hellish sufferings of her soul, of her sorrowful and aimless conscience. You see, friends, what a lesson. We don't know. Some people are like, I would never do this. If you were in that person's life, we would probably do even worse. We don't know. We're talking about the whole nine yards that is surrounding the person. And this is what he's saying here. What do you know? So John exclaimed, defending the principles of old law, you see, that's a dialogue, very inflamed with emotions, right? We feel them. Hello, Rita de Cassia. You know, Jacob. Good for you. You don't judge people. That's great. You are harder on yourself. That's the true spiritist. Hello, Julia, bringing some Australian breeze and let it come to us to warm us up. <laughs> I know, you don't like to judge, me neither, but it's sometimes difficult to refrain the impulse that we bring from so many lives. So John was like, but she sinned and lived up to the punishment. Is it not written that people shall pay penny by penny for their mistakes? The master smiled. You see, he's still like arguing. John is arguing, in a way, he's like, in this conversation. And Jesus, smiling, he's not disturbed, and he's still explaining. We need to practice this, right? Thank you, Rita, for being here. So we need to practice this. Somebody comes and is like, but we have to do this, don't you see? Remember, you are at work. I remember one day I was at the University of Maryland and uh, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, who barely knew English, he just came from another country. He was learning something in science and then he came and said that uh, one of the equipments broke. And I was there when I saw one colleague of mine coming and being so upset and furious. And then I just recalled this passage. And Mentor Joseph said, you're not going to say anything, Vanessa? And I said, I'm not going to say anything. Are you sure? I was almost like Pontius Pilate, like, let them crucify the man. He must have done something. But I know... He was like new, he was learning, he didn't know the language well, he didn't do it on purpose. 
Then I breathe in and out of courage. And I said, okay, Mr. Joseph will. And then I said, you know, my friend, do you think he did it on purpose? Ah, it doesn't matter. I think it does. I think it does because if he didn't do it on purpose, if he didn't know exactly the instructions because of the language barriers, we shouldn't be that harsh on him because, you know, after all, he's also learning. So let's give him a break. And then she looked at me like, Ah, Vanessa, you. And I said, Not me. <laughs> I didn't say it was Mentor Joseph because I couldn't say these things there. But seriously, it took me a while to have the courage, but I don't regret a minute I said something. Today, I think if I hadn't taken that approach, I would probably not feel good about myself. So that's the lesson for us. When we bring these teachings of Jesus, like the courage. Mine was a tiny scenario, but we can practice in our families, at work, in our communities, in our organizations. We need to practice it, you know? And Jesus is teaching us. People are going to demand later that you be harsh, that you fulfill the law, that you punish people. He smiled without being disturbed and explained, No one can deny that the woman sinned. Who will be irreprehensible on earth? But who will be irreprehensible on earth? There are priests of the law, judges and philosophers, who prostituted their souls for lower prices. However, I have not seen their accusers. Hypocrisy usually remains unpunished. Hypocrisy usually remains unpunished. So true. Because there are many hypocrites who are protecting the hypocrite. Exactly. Hello, Justina, beautiful family. I miss you, my friend. So, um, hypocrisy usually remains unpunished while stones are thrown at sufferers. So, he's telling that that woman, before any other labor, she was suffering. John, the world is full of hypocrites, whitewashed thumbs. But God is the father of infinite goodness that awaits the prodigal children in his home. Could there be for the humble sinner greater torment than that to which she has condemned herself indefinitely? How many times has she not had bread to soothe her hunger nor a gesture of sincere affection to soothe her anguish so only Jesus to understand us because the world doesn't rare pains in the world will be comparable to the agonies of her silent and sad nights surprising huh? this is her painful hell her afflicting sentence you see in our own suffering, we are creating our sentencing. That's how it is. That's why Jesus tells us that God doesn't punish us. Because we are the ones who create the reaction to our actions, the effect to the causes of our actions. Mm -hmm. In all areas of life, the institution of divine justice naturally occur, works with its principles of compensation. Now I'm going to read to you something that I separated that complements this all. Hello, Sergio. I saw you there too. You were there, my friend. Good seeing you there. Now, let's pay attention to this. In another book... Not in English yet. Oh, we're just dreaming, right, Josiah, about the day we have so many hundreds of these books in English. And Josiah has been working hard for that cause, too. Hello, Marco. Yeah, 
The harder we are, the more guilty we create. You're right. We need to surrender to love. But when Jesus is talking about the principles of compensation, divine justice, Emmanuel kindly, in a chapter of this book that is yet to be translated, Sefer de Luz, chapter 41, he says, We are all being called by God to apply not only our money, but also our health, our conditions in life, our resources, our profession, our abilities, our understanding, our culture, our relationships, and our possibilities in favor of others. Because for these actions, we'll be either having more value or depreciated and will be accountable in the accountability of eternal justice. That's exactly what he's saying here. She's making choices. That action already has reactions. Silent and sad nights. But he's talking about her context. So we understand. So when people want to learn what is understanding, just read this paragraph again and again. He guides us into how we should learn about understanding somebody's life. Learn deeply about their lives. And then you understand. For example, we often tell children, if you want to know your parents better and understand why they're this, that way, and that way, go ask them or find out about their childhood, about their family life. Very likely, you're going to get an answer. And then you have more compassion. Because there is no way to achieve compassion without understanding. Some people think that compassion is just like, ah, No. Compassion only comes as a result of understanding. We need to understand. Not necessarily know it all. But understanding... Not means like being invasive to people. I say, tell me more about your life. But think about the possibilities. For example, we're driving in a highway. Somebody's cutting us. And we're like, hey. That's the, the expression, right? Like, hey. And we think, oh, well. This person is doing this for a reason. Maybe. They're not doing well. They need to go to the bathroom fast. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you never know. They're feeling pain. There is a child on the back seat and they get they need to get to the doctor fast. Or they need to breastfeed. It happened to me sometimes. I was driving. Virginia was crying. I needed to stop somewhere to breastfeed her. What can I do? <laughs> when she was a baby. And... You know, I was, if the police ever stopped me back then, I would say, I'm sorry, officer, but the baby is screaming and I need to breastfeed. I'm joking. I'm not excusing myself of complying, being compliant to the law. But there is a reason. There is a reason. Even if it's crazy, but there is. Each one, says Jesus, carries the sacred spark of the Creator. And inside we have a shrine of God's presence or the bleak wall of denial. But only light and good are eternal. And one day all strongholds of evil will fall so that God may shine in the spirit of his children. So he's saying, friends, do not sentence anyone because God is taking care of everyone. We have inside of us the sacred fire of the Creator, the sacred spark. No wonder. You see how these books go hand in hand with Kardec's books, like the, the Spirit's book. When Kardec asks, what is the definition of spirit? Hmm? And they are like, oh well, with uh, your vocabulary it's going to be hard, but... Let's say it's like a spark, like a flame. Have you ever visualized yourself as a flame? 
we need to visualize ourselves more and more like this sacred spark of the Creator, beyond the physical, beyond the temporary settings. That's the only way for us to cherish this joy, this courage, and the hope that Jesus is saying. Some people asked me one day, but Vanessa, when Jesus talks about, you know, cherishing joy and courage and hope, how do we do it? That's a perfect question. How do we do it? We need first to feel that we're connected to God. Where does joy come from? Knowing that we're children of God? There's a song, you know, there's a song at the Spirit Society of Baltimore. Our dear friend Al Morales received this beautiful song that became a song for the children, but also for adults. And Steve Shepherd with Selenia Shepherd, who discarnated already, good friend, they put it together. It's more or less like this. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I reincarnated to learn to do good. Reincarnation, the path of progress. Reincarnation, the opportunity. Reincarnation, the way to become good, to achieve true happiness. And then we sing, You are a child of God. And goes on and on, and then we sing like, We are the children of God. When you sing or you meditate, you're a child of God. And the blessings it is to be a child of God. Don't you feel joy? Do you? That's the first therapeutic moment. It took a while, huh? Yes. Do you feel joy when you reflect that you're a child of God? That you are the heir of the universe. Herdeiro do universo. The heir of the universe. Can you imagine? The abundance of God is ours too. Because we're his children. Can you imagine that? Joy. And the hope. Because we're not going to stay stuck in this temporary position. And the courage. To work hard hard and with our hearts and not only that what else we're gonna do we are also going to make effort and repetition effort and repetition to learn and progress remember the movement of progress is always like effort repetition there is no way for us to master anything on this earth without repetition look at the athletes like we said once, Michael Phelps, the greatest Olympian of all times. How did he become it? He made effort and repeated every day, every day, day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. You're going to be the best of the best, of course. So if you and I, every day, we repeat, 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 doing good, doing good, thinking good, thinking good, and feeling God, and loving people, and try our hard. One day, gold medal, gold medal, record-breaking. We're different. We're changed. Even the obsessors like, ah, oh, whoa, he changed. Whoa, she changed. I better change myself too. Yeah, right? You feel good, Osvaldo. That's wonderful. And you too, Marco. Yes. Mm -hmm. Creating a good habit, Vanessa. Exactly, my friend. So, effort and repetition, that lessons in the book Evolution into Worlds by the Spirit André Luis through Chico Xavier. The mechanisms of learning encompass, it's twofold, effort, repetition, effort and repetition, okay? Thus, the reason why it's written in the law, you are God's. Do you not know, John, that the inheritance of a father is equally divided among his children? The misguided ones are those who are not able to take possession of their divine share 
they exchange it for the satisfaction of their abusive or disorderly whims, for crime or egotism. And you know, the definition of crime here just means something against the law, not necessarily human crime. It can be worse than that. Thinking bad about others is crime because it goes against God's laws, of course. Love, love. We're thinking bad. It's a crime. Of course it is. Gossiping about pe crime. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not going to keep saying anything. But this chapter is about punishment and sin, so we're talking about what pertains. They pay a high price for their voluntary decisions. Having examined the situation in this light, Jesus says we must recognize in the world a vast school, a vast school of regeneration where all beings rehabilitate from the betrayal of their own duties. Yes, we have done that for many times, many lives. Finally, we're regenerating ourselves. We're changing. We're improving. We're transforming ourselves. The earth, therefore, can be seen as a great hospital. Where seen is the disease of all. Definition. What is seen? A disease. The disease of all of us. The gospel, however, brings to the sick individual the effective remedy so that all roads are transformed into smooth paths, paths of redemption. Only Jesus could bring that beautiful remedy for our souls. Do you feel therapeutic moment now? Do you feel like you're a sinner in the sense of the word? That we're like ill in some form? You don't need to tell me. But if you do, the gospel has the effective remedy. Because it's going to transform our roads into a smooth path of redemption. You know, we're going to learn to surrender ourselves to God. It's not about our will. It's about God's will. Mm -hmm. That's why we do not condemn the sinner to eliminate sin. Says Jesus. These are Jesus' words. That's why we do not condemn the sinner to eliminate sin. Have you ever stopped talking to somebody because they made a choice that you do not agree with. If you did it, you're condemning their, them. Have you ever stopped having a relationship with somebody just because they made choices that go against your core principles? Jesus is teaching us something completely different. He's saying we do not condemn the sinner to eliminate sin. And in all circumstances, I always prefer to believe in the good. I always prefer to believe in the good. How often during one day of your life do you believe in the good? Let's say, never, rarely, sometimes, often, always. How often... Do you believe in the good? How often? Rarely, never, sometimes, often, always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jacob, for sharing it. Right? So think about this. Jesus is giving us a remedy of the gospel. He prefers in all circumstances. He didn't say in some. He said in all circumstances, no exception. I always prefer to believe in the good. He always prefers to believe in the good. John, when you see the saddest and most miserable beings crawling on a night fraught with shadows and desolation, 
Remember the choir seed that contains a divine germ that one day will rise from the bosom of the earth to receive a luminous kiss from the sun. Orphan, yes. Good, Osvaldo. So he's saying, we have the divine seed. It's going to sprout, it's going to grow, it's going to become beautiful, mature. It's going to give fruits and flowers and shadow to those who are passing by. We can't forget, never condemn me, but in all circumstances, I prefer always to believe in the good. I always prefer to believe in the good. We should have it as an affirmation. Say it to yourself. Let's do this exercise. In all circumstances, I also always prefer to believe in the good. In all circumstances, I always prefer to believe in the good. I always prefer to believe in the good. I always prefer to believe in the good. You know, this movement of believing in the good is this search for the beauty of God inside of everything and everyone. Like when we said about the dog that is dead, the disciples like, ew, and Jesus was saying, this dog must have had beautiful teeth. Always preferring to believe in the good. Always. Even in ourselves. Always. It's a constant daily exercise. John, when you see the saddest and the most beautiful, the most uh, miserable being, don't forget that they are children of God, that they are also going to pass that moment. After the explanation, John was really admiring what Jesus was saying with his lucid gaze. He then began to meditate on the teachings. Well, not long after that event, Jesus traveled from Capernaum to Jerusalem and he was followed by some of his disciples. There were traditions of the Jews, festivals, and the Messiah arrived on a Saturday. Uh-oh! Under the strict surveillance of the rigorously observant spirits of his time. I'm going to put a pause again here. So we can discuss this. When we talk about reincarnation, many people ask, but Vanessa, how will I know, you know, what I need to do in this life if I don't remember what happened in previous lives, etc., the reincarnatory plan? It's easy. As St. Augustine talks in the Gospel according to Spiritism, chapter 14, observe your tendencies, observe your impulses, so, for example, if we in this life focus too much on what others are doing, constantly condemning, constantly sentencing, constantly doing this, imagine in previous lives. So we need to be humbled by our own observation and say, you know, I better not judge. Because if today I'm being that strict, imagine in the past. I probably have condemned many people and I'll be in trouble. Shocking the fanatics, the master healed and consoled in his glorious journey of redemption. Explaining that the Sabbath was made for the people enough, and not people for the Sabbath. He is smilingly, <laughs> this master is really unique. He changes the traditions. You see, he's kind, loving, but he's also very courageous. But he smiles. And that, that is also a concern for, the, for his critics. Seeing no ma so many blind and lame crowded along the passage, James questioned, Master, being that God is so merciful, why does he punish his children with such horrible defects and diseases? 
That's a good question. James, do you believe that God in all his wisdom and love would lower himself to punish his own children? Hello, Sally. Yeah, Jacob, let me let me just share something with you. We just uh, were talking about crime since we were reading here, saying that whenever we go against God's laws, by definition, a law, if you're against the law, you're an outlaw. It could well be, right? A crime. But don't be bothered by the words. You know, labels and names are not important, but what you're doing is, is the goal. You don't like to judge, and you're doing great. So, let's see here. James, do you believe that God will lower himself to punish his own children? The Father has a plan with respect for the whole creation. But within that plan, every being plays a part in the building for which they will be held accountable. Every being plays a part in the building. Therapeutic moment for us. Do you know the part you play? in the building of the universe? Do you know? Do you doubt you have it? Do you? Because some people are like, me? Me? Yes, you. You, everyone plays a part in the building. Abandoning the divine work to live at the mercy of one's own whims the soul creates for oneself the corresponding situation. He's talking about the law of action and reaction. And then we work to reintegrate ourselves into the divine plan after having been carried away by the ill-fated suggestions which are contrary to its own peace. Friends, he's talking about action and reaction. Mm-hmm. John understood the words of the Messiah were the confirmation of the teachings he heard before. Then they moved away from the pool of Bethsaida where there were like many people who wanted to be healed, right? And they were told to be miraculous waters. And here is where the master made the lame walk, gave sight to the blind, and cleansed the lepers. On a Saturday, on, a, on the Sabbath, in the company of James and John, the Lord walked to the temple where one of the paralytic men whom he had healed reported the incident full of heartfelt joy. Jesus approached him, making clear to his disciples that he wished to confirm the teachings about sin and punishment. He openly said, as we read in the Gospel of John, See, you are well again. Stop sinning. Stop sinning. Or worse may happen to you. Stop missing the mark. Sin miss means missing the mark. It's like you're trying to, you know, get to the target, but you miss the mark. Sinning. That's what it means. Mm-hmm. What is interesting is that Umberto de Campos, right now in the wrap-up of this chapter, he says something quite unique that is probably a revelation for all of us because unless we are historians and we work in the judicial system and we know about the history of humanity regarding it, we will never know what he's going to say. He says the following... <clears throat> Since those teachings were offered, new ideas of fraternity spread throughout the world with respect to the deviants, criminals, and enemies, reaching the very political organization of the nations. The Roman Empire was desensitized to the most nefarious processes of regeneration or of revenge. Ignorant slaves were pasture for the beasts in public amusements because of the most trifling incidents which occurred 
in the patricians' homes. Once, 30,000 servants, 30,000 servants, to whom all treasures of the Spirit were denied, were crucified at a party next to the magnificent aqueducts of the Apian Way. Humiliating beatings were a soft punishment. 30,000 servants. However, since that afternoon in which Jesus met the sinner in front of the crowd, a new thought came to gradually dominate the spirit of the world. The gospel, the substance of the gospel, infiltrated the judiciary system of all peoples. Society began to understand their obligations and sought to segregate the criminal as the ill who needs to be isolated. When modern judges nowadays give their sentences without having ever handled the New Testament, perhaps they ignore that they proceed in such a way because Jesus was the great reformer of criminology. Jesus. Jesus, okay? Jesus was the one who changed, who really installed, implemented in our judicial system. He inserted the elements of love and charity. From that day on, humanity changed. The question for us here today is, how often are we actually opening ourselves to understand where we are not compliant with the laws of God? And how do we proceed from thereafter? How often do we judge ourselves First and foremost, we need to stop that movement of judging and being more understanding. Can I give an example? I'll give you a simple example. Uh, Divaldo Franco. One day, Joana de Angelis came to him and said, Divaldo, this happened when he was very young. Divaldo, if you are very tired, and you are serving people, and you observe that you can't go on any longer, stop before you reach that limit so you don't become irritated. Because when we become irritated, we're going against the law of love. Right? Kindness. So from thereafter, he started observing himself knowing his own limits so he could be loving and kind, respecting his limits. Okay? That's exactly what Jesus is asking us. When he says, stop sinning or something worse may happen, he said, go deep inside of you and find out the root cause of those addictions or those behaviors. And cut it by the root. Then you'll be freer. Then you're going to be able to stop it. This lesson today is about action and reaction. But under the glasses of the love of justice, love and charity. Go to the Spirit's book and read that chapter. It's in part three of the book, Love, Justice, Love, and Charity. You're going to be delighted and lighter when you get to know that, you know, it's not that hard for us to really do that immersion inside of ourselves. For now, what can we do? Cherish fraternity and look at others with more merciful eyes, thinking that Often people are more fragile than good, says Jesus. Than bad, than evil. They're more fragile than evil. We're often more fragile than evil. Filled with fear. Filled with limitations of our own thinking. 
we create these obstacles. Dear friends, today we're more empowered. Today we have all the reasons to go to sleep or go to work or do whatever we need for our family, friends, and communities with a lighter heart, knowing that there is no punishment. There are only consequences for our actions. And deep inside, we're never sinners. We actually those who still need the remedy of the gospel. Let us drink it today. I'm going to serve you the remedy of the gospel, the gospel, and you're serving to me too. Let us drink it. And we are going to be healed from inside out. So I wish you lots of blessings. And when we come back tomorrow, God providing, we're going to have a lot of fun learning with Nicodemus. It's chapter 14. The lesson to Nicodemus and all of us. Big hug and kiss of gratitude to all of you. Until tomorrow.